believes that everybody is doing the best they can mm -hmm. given how they perceive their environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also what we call competency-based. So uh, rather than looking at what's wrong with people, it's always focused on their potential and what's right. For example, the way we view development the way people change and grow isn't that you take something away. It's that you add to the repertoire of who people are. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a, an add-on type of model. It's also based on something we call the paradoxical theory of change. Mm -hmm. And what that basically means is the way you change isn't by trying to change. It's mm -hmm. by, by becoming aware of who you are. Now this might sound a little Eastern and a little Zen-like. And some of the founders of Gestalt Therapy actually had experience in working in a sort of an Eastern approach. So I think it was one of the first approaches that really combines Western psychology and Eastern psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also been supported, you know, in terms of staying with the optimism that uh, neurologists have found that bad experiences tend to stay in our body longer than positive experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us in Western society have the experience, if you take a test and you get 45 out of 50 questions right, most of us will go to the five we got wrong and mm -hmm. manage to find a way to, to feel bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the other reason why I think optimism is uh, so much a part of who we are is that we believe that when people master things, when they learn things, these things become background. And that when there are problems, people often focus to what, what is wrong. And they forget all the things they're doing right. Because in any moment of time, I, you, me, our group, we're always doing many things right and many things wrong. Mm -hmm. And once you can uh, begin to pay attention to what you're doing well, you can begin to use that as a base. Now, we're not naive. We don't just pat people on the head and say, that's great. But there's mm -hmm. something about... Uh, being positive and optimistic that, 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 that optimistic that opens up your heart and allows you to be open to change. When you're pessimistic, when you're negative, you, you tighten up. Now there are advantages to that. If you're walking down a dangerous street at night, you want to be tight, you want to be vigilant. Uh, but most of us, I think, through our upbringing, we become vigilant even when there's no reason to become vigilant. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the concept of optimism uh, is very, very much a core to what, what we do, and we've done a lot of writing actually on, on optimism, so it, it's part of the basis for what we do. And uh, we, by optimism we also mean competence, so that people are always competent and not competent. And often when a system is in trouble, they're focused on what's not competent. And of course, the sad joke that often happens is an organization will call me in to work as a consultant. And the first question I'll ask them is, well, tell me what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell me what's wrong. And then as the consultant, I'll do an assessment, I'll interview people. And then I'll tell them, well, this is what all the things that we found that's wrong with your organization. And as if that's supposed to make them feel better. The truth is, I think in 95% of the cases, people know what's wrong. What mm -hmm. they don't know is what's right. Mm -hmm. And once they begin to capture all that's right with themselves or with their work group, or with their project group, or with their leadership group, uh, they become much more open to change. Mm -hmm. So that's why we start with what a system is doing well. Once we establish that, uh, then they're open to change and then we can also begin to look at what needs to be developed. What's something that they can uh, add to their repertoire, to their skill set that would make a difference? So that's, mm -hmm. I'm sort of giving you the beginning of the model. Mm -hmm. As I was listening to you, the, the concept of appreciative inquiry came to mind. Yeah, yeah, it's... I suppose uh, it's an accident. Like no, it's... 
it's very similar and it's very different at, 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 at the same time. As a matter of fact, uh, appreciative inquiry has a lot of its roots in Case Western University in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and where uh, the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland exists, which is our roots also. But uh, getting back to appreciative inquiry, uh, I think there was a lot of uh, cross fertilization. Uh, uh, certainly, John Carter, uh, I think, wrote one of the first chapters uh, in one of the first appreciative inquiry roots, and Brenda Jones who's one of your uh, speakers. Uh, she's, uh, I think she's representing that center. She also uh, was very much involved at NTL and also took some of the programs here. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn Lukensmeyer was, uh, helped establish a lot of OD programs and uh, Carolyn has often been connected with Cleveland and with our institute. And she actually has a chapter in the book that Edward and I do. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization and everything in, in terms of all this approach. So, uh, mm -hmm. I, I love them all. I mean, um, mainly because I think they have a lot of the same, a lot of the same base, a lot of the positive approach, a lot of the optimism. Uh, I think people will be very interested in how does it work in practice? How should I imagine, I don't know, a Cape Cod consultancy process? So if you could summarize it sort of shortly, how should I visualize a process like that? Well, it's interesting that you're using the concept of the words visualize, because we start out uh, in terms of, let's say, working with a leadership group. Uh, let's say there were seven people in, in the group. Our first, what we first need to do is we need to create some trust and some connection and we would probably start out, uh, if I was the consultant, by engaging each person in the group uh, and beginning to establish a little bit of a relationship back and forth till we all feel fairly comfortable. Because one of our primary uh, concepts is uh, you can't impact anybody unless there's enough trust so that they allow you to, to sort of meddle with them a little. They have, they have to respect you, or if there goes the, uh, there we go. They have to uh, have enough respect to, with you, feel relaxed enough, feel comfortable with you, to, to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the first thing we do. My guess is that's not so different than any intervener, no matter how you intervene. Because if people don't feel relaxed with you, you can't uh, impact them. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we do. Mm -hmm. uh, then. You know, depending on who we're working with, we'll sort of get an agenda about what mm -hmm. they want to talk about. We'll buy into it. And then we'll describe ourselves as process consultants, that we pay attention to how people interact together and what goes on between them. We do not focus on in individuals primarily. Now, we're going to differentiate between, between what we call a self-organizing group and a hierarchical group, one where there's a specific leader in the in the room versus, let's say, a peer team, a project team. And maybe if you want, I could go into some of the differences. But let's say with either one of them, uh, we will then instruct them and say mm -hmm. that we really want to pay attention to how you are together and we want to support you. And what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do, is I'm going to sit back and pay attention. Mm -hmm. And when I see something that might be useful, mm -hmm. I'm going to intervene and I'm going to tell you, is that okay? Mm -hmm. If people say yes to that, then I sit back and I, and I observe, begin to observe the whole group, not, mm -hmm. not particular individuals. If there are any objections or they'll say, uh, we want to talk to you, for example. We've been talking with each other for three meetings. We haven't gotten anywhere. That's why we, we brought you. Mm -hmm. Well, that, in the short mm -hmm. language, we call, we call it, know, yeah? It's often that people are surprised or, well, just, uh, yeah, surprised by this attitude of why should we talk to each other <laughs> when you're here, fine. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. yeah. because uh, I think like many of the approaches that you're going to have at the summit, we're not a content-oriented approach. We don't give advice. We don't tell people what to do. We take mm -hmm. a look at how they are with each other. Uh, but if somebody does have an objection, 
uh, to what we're doing, uh, we welcome it because uh, there's always a little bit of an objection when you have an outsider paying attention to you. And if people raise an objection, if they say, let, let's say they're very brave and they say, what a stupid thing to do. How can you do something so stupid? Okay, let's say it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an angry person. Uh, if that's an opportunity to join them. In, in Gestalt language, we call that resistance. And we, we expect there's always resistance because there's always forces for change and there's always forces for sameness. And if we represent the forces for change, there's a part of each person that wants to stay the same. So we engage that person and, we, and it's an opportunity to really have a dialogue. And everybody else is watching this. And if we can connect once there's a little bit of resistance or there's some objections, that's I think when the trust really begins to build. So we pay a lot of attention to that at the beginning. Then we ask them to start talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we let them go for you know, a period of time what's aesthetically correct. And then we might jump in and we might say, I might say, excuse me, I think I have something uh, that you might want to hear. Or I should have said this previously, but we also ask them, of course, if they want something from us while they're talking, or from me, they can ask me. If, and I'll, I'll respond as best I can. But let's say they, they don't. I've paid attention. And I noticed something that, uh, that, that, that they're doing that's, uh, that's, that's quite, quite positive. It might be that when one person speaks, everybody else in the group responds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I might comment on the high responsiveness. Mm -hmm that there's a real a lovely sense of connection. People don't look out the window, somebody says something and everybody sort of jumps in and, and gives their, their response. <laughs> now, uh, once I make that intervention, uh, I'm going to stay in there and ask them if they understand the inf uh, if they understand what I'm saying because we appreciate that there's a difference between conceptualizing something out here and, and, having, and putting it into a system so that it makes a difference. And that's a real so, art. So is this part of the process that you would always check? Yes. If you understood your art, you could back. And if it matters and if it makes sense. We call that making an intervention stick. And some mm -hmm. of the uh, concepts that we use in our approach is, is the concept of presence. Like, I have to have a certain way of being in the world that I can impact. If I, can't imp I can, if I can conceptualize things, but I can't impact them and make a difference, then it's not going to matter. How can you get the sense of them really understanding it? That how do you feel that you have had impact? That's a great question. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Because uh, I, might, I might ask them... Uh, but I've got the same problems, you see. So that's yeah. why I'm... Well, I can, I can ask them, okay? And they can say, I can say, does that make sense to you? And they can say, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> if they roll their eyes and they go, sure. I'm not, you know, I'm gonna say, well, you're saying yes, but you're sort of shrugging your shoulders. And it's really okay if, if, if what I said uh, didn't make sense to you or you, or you don't believe me, but, but tell me. Mm -hmm. So again, that we call that working with the resistance. So that's how I know. Mm -hmm. And then they might say, and they might say, no, no, it really, it really, I really got it. It really mattered. I really get it. Well, they might say, yeah, it's, I mean, so what? Mm -hmm. I knew that. I knew that anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll engage them a little more. And if, if in fact they did knew them, or, or my intervention stunk, it was trivial. Then I'll, I'll say, excuse me, and I'll go back and I'll listen again. But, but if, uh, if they say, I don't get it, then, then the, we, we use what we call uh, experiential data or phenomenological data. I might say to that person, I say, Mary, do you remember when you talked about your struggles with your boss, that John said something to you and Jim said something to, to you and George? And she, oh, yeah. Okay. And I might give another example. So I have the data that supports my intervention, but 
back, back in my head, and it's available for me to use that. So is your feedback based on objective data, or do you also give personal feelings and very subjective feedback to them as well? Rarely. It's, all, it, it, it's, it, it's based on what I'm observing in the system. Okay. Sometimes I can separate from that, I can come up with a metaphor. Okay. It could be a, maybe a swarm, uh, a bunch of bees all mingling with each other. Okay. I typically don't like to use a lot of metaphors. Some practitioners do. I like to stay close to the data. I give them that feedback that how, what a responsive group they are. Okay. Now, this is what we call our paradoxical theory of change, that once they become aware of what they're doing, they'll often go to what we call a less developed part. Mm -hmm. okay. So they might start talking about this, and then they might all start talking one at a time and not having the feedback in terms of what everybody says. And that might be the beginning, that might give me some indication of how this group could develop better. Because their problem might be that they all care and like about each other, but they never seem to finish anything. Okay? They never seem to get to their goals. Mm -hmm. So then my second intervention will be what we call uh, the price they pay for being that way. Because whenever mm -hmm. you, you're a certain way, there's positives and there's negatives. So my second, I might, so I might watch them sort of slow down a little and pay attention to one person rather than having the energy pop all around the room. I'll watch them for a while and I might say, excuse me. I think I've noticed something else. It's wonderful how responsive each one of you is to each other. But do you notice that you pay a price for this? Do you notice that you don't stay with one subject, you don't stay on track, because one person talks and people go here, and another person talks and they go here. And it's lively, it's exciting, it's interesting. Whoop, I just got, there we go. It's lively and it's interesting, but you don't get to your goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully they, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. And that, and again, I, I check out, I've made that intervention to see if it matters, do they understand it, I've got the, all this data here to mm -hmm. support it, and let's say they, uh, they say, yeah, that's, that's true. And then they start focusing on it, and again, they begin to, to move towards their goals, but in a lot of groups, they're going to go back to what they do well, which is back and forth, and what we would call, using other language, a deflective system. Mm -hmm. So that would get us to the third, uh, or basically the fourth part, part of our model. The first is the, the contact with the group. Mm -hmm. The second is to land an intervention, to make it stick in terms of an area of competency, in terms of what they do well. The third intervention is what we call less developed, developing the price they pay. It can be a polarity. We land that intervention. If, and sometimes that's all you need. With a really uh, a, a pretty uh, a competent group, you might tell them what they do well. And they might say, okay, they might all, all, already get it. Yeah, we do that well, but it costs us. So sometimes just landing that first intervention is enough. Sometimes you go to the second, what's developing or less developed. And if that doesn't work, we have something that we used to call experiment. It's got a long history in Gestalt therapy, but we're trying to not use that word anymore because it. It's got bad connotations of a, of a wild researcher, sort of, you know, in, sub, you know, in subjects and, and doing bad things to people. So we call try this. And we say, well, would you, would you like to try something? That might help, help you. And they might say, yeah. Hopefully they'll say, yeah. If they say no, then you want to find out why they're saying no. But then we're going to be respectful of who they are. And let's say they say yes. Uh, it might be just something real simple. Would you experiment with uh, whenever one person speaks, only one person can respond? And just see how that is. Mm -hmm. And we do that because we want them to practice something different 
in the moment. Gestalt therapy, the Gestalt approach, is very much what we call a here and now approach. We work with the present. Mm -hmm. So they go ahead and they do it. And all of a sudden they find that they're slowed down, that they're getting on track. And then we have them talk about it. And then the last step, which I think is probably true in most approaches, we call meaning making. Mm -hmm. And then we ask them, so, so what was this like for you? What, what are the takeaways? What have you learned? Uh, any idea how you're going to use this when you, you know, in your daily functioning as a group? Mm -hmm. And that would be a, a, a typical session. So interesting. I would like to learn it. And I would like to come to, to your master class. What am I? expecting what how am i going to learn this what are you going to teach participants about this i'm going to teach you how to see in the way we see i'm going to have some a lot of fun experiential exercises i'm going to teach you how to see a system without looking at individuals which is very hard for people to do uh, then uh, I'll do one of two things. Uh, I'd love it if we can get a real group in there. I think uh, might even try to pull your leadership group in, if you like. If you like a consult from us, because we believe in this approach, and we, we'd much rather have it, because it works. If that does, if, if we are, we're unable to do that for whatever the reasons, then we'll, we'll create some simulated groups. And uh, I would like to demonstrate the approach with these groups, but ideally, I think we have a day and a half, which is a, a nice amount of time. I want to have the experience of practicing. So I, I, the idea isn't to just uh, have you have the, the concepts in your head. We really believe in doing and practicing. So it's not going to be a, a, a bunch of lectures. There'll be some lectures. Uh, I'm very interested in what... Uh, what keeps people from seeing a system. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're seeing s seven or eight people, for example, in a group, one of the problems is you might be drawn to an individual or you might be drawn to content. Uh, this, is pre this is pretty typical. So uh, we'll, be work we'll be working with that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about optimism and have you try some uh, exercises uh, Look, looking at how to look in an optimistic way or to look in a pessimistic way. So mm -hmm. it's going to be highly interactive. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we're really committed in our institute. We have this belief that you don't learn much by lectures. You learn by doing, and then the questions that come out of the doing is what we want to respond to. Mm -hmm. If you were to come to our center and you were to take one of our programs, it, it, it's highly experiential. We kept cutting back lectures more and more. But we want people, if you have that question inside of you, I think that's what stimulates learning. Not somebody sort of throwing facts out at you. If I were a potential participant, is that, so when I complete this masterclass, will I be able to use this method with my own clients? Can I uh, make it part of my usual leadership workshops for you? I, I, I'd be stunned if you, if you didn't. Uh, I don't think if, if you're a, a very experienced practitioner, you have a way of doing it, and you, you'll, add it, you'll add chunks of this to your repertoire. I mean, I think that's what, what we all do. I, I'd be very concerned if anybody came to our program and threw out all that they knew and then substituted what we do. But I think there'll be a lot of symmetry between, uh, just in, in terms of who are teaching the master classes and what the orientation is. So my guess is that people will have a little bit of that perspective. As I'm, uh, as I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that most of what I'm saying is not foreign to you. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and similar to, to, to some mm -hmm. of your approach, and a little bit different. And, that, and that's what I'd expect. So I, I, I would expect that some, some people will take a small amount of what we do. For some people, they'll take a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm of our model. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, all, all work is situational. So there'll be a lot of situations that we uh, won't address. So I don't know whether we'll be talking about the difference between, like I say, what we call a self-organizing group or a peer group. 
versus a hierarchical group? How do you work with a group that has a le uh, leader, somebody in positional power? I hope there'll be a little time to get into uh, some, some other issues, uh, depending on the size of the class and what we're doing. I hope there's some people who, who will be involved with social change and conflict. Mm -hmm. And we've been working a lot on that. Uh, we have a new paper that we're just about to finish on contempt mm -hmm. as uh, one of the uh, experiences that really causes tremendous pain in the world and causes shame in individuals and really keeps conflict going over and over again. I might bring some copies of that to the, to the class. We believe that uh, ideally we want people to work with another person. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing our training programs right here at the center, uh, and they're pretty intense. Like I said, our basic program is three eight-day modules. What we'll do is you'll be assigned a partner and mm -hmm. you'll be working with them. Mm -hmm. Now if I could go back to the very beginning, when I say to the, uh, let's say the two of you, let's say I was working with the two of you, you were a leadership team, the two of you owned your own company and you wanted to develop something while you were having conflicts. And I was working with you uh, and I had the luxury of having my buddy here, let's say uh, Edwin. Uh, when, I pull, when, I, when, I, when I would say to you, when, uh, I'm, I'd like the two of you to talk to each other and Edwin and I are going to pull away and pay attention to you. Uh, when we see something that we think might be useful to you, I'm going to pull way back and we're going to have a conversation. And we'd like you to, to listen to it. And then based on our conversation, I'm going to come back in and, and tell you something that we might think will be helpful. I think that's what you're referring to. Yes, okay. that's right. So um, this, this is a part, but only one version of it, it's right? what, Well, we use it for training. The advantage of that mm -hmm. uh, is that in this conversation, we can, we can say all sorts of things and you're going to be listening in a very different way than you will be if I talk directly to you. Mm -hmm. We also use it because we're training people how to, how to work in a pair as consultants. Uh, I often use the analogy that when I was growing up, I would often... Uh, listen, uh, to put my ear to the wall next to my parents' bedroom to figure out what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So this allows you to listen in on us. So there's an advantage to that. It's another way of you hearing what we're saying. And of course, we're very aware that everything we're saying, you're listening. So it allows us an opportunity to slip in interventions mm -hmm. that, that we don't have a, enough energy to put in. Uh, the other reason now, ideally, uh, I love to work with another uh, consultant, but often, uh, and uh, if I have another consultant, I'll actually use that model. Mm -hmm. But often, uh, people won't pay two of us to work with the group. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that, because <laughs> this is a problem I've come across yeah. as well. When I wanted to use this, uh, method that we are talking about right now, but uh, it was physically or not rather yes. financially impossible. That's right. But what I will do is I'll pull away mm -hmm. and I might say, I might say, this might sound strange to you, but I'm going to talk to myself. Because mm -hmm. I want to say the stuff out loud. But what I want to do is I want to disengage from the system and mm -hmm. get back into myself and sit back and and formulate what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing in such a way that when I present it, it'll have mm -hmm. impact. It'll be clear, it'll be concise, it'll make a difference. And it's sometimes hard to formulate things in my head. Another... So is it speaking, uh, thinking aloud? Yeah, that's right. So I, so I might think aloud. I might... Mm -hmm. uh, so we have all sorts of uh, techniques to sort of pull away. I sometimes, I, I might imagine I'm a bird outside looking in. Mm -hmm. If I was a bird, what, what would I be seeing? Because the, the, the worst experience, I think, I, I know the two of you can identify with this, is freezing and not, and not being able to see anything. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that's, that's always terrifying. So the idea is to say, how, how can I stay loose? Mm -hmm. Sometimes like turning to another, another does that. But getting back to your question, we, we do use it all the time as a training model. Uh, if I have the luxury of having somebody else with me, 
We teach it like if you picture people playing the piano. We, we're teaching, what, one of the things I love about our approach is we break it down into bite-sized pieces. But there's a very difference between playing scales and we're saying, we, we have mainly experienced people who've got wonderful habits that are very good at what they do and we're trying to say to them, forget what you do, which is hard, especially when you're good at it because you do it well, and try this. So we break it down into about eight or nine different pieces. And we say, practice it this way. Now we expect them when they go out into the world, they're gonna do it their own way. And they'll do it 85% uh, of the way we do it, or they'll, they'll take 10% to augment what they do because they're very satisfied with what they do. But when they're here taking our program, we want them to try it our way. We have no, no investment. It isn't what we call a paint by number approach. You know, one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven. Uh, for everything we do, there are a lot of uh, very respected principles. Uh, so I can explain to you the operational aspects of that approach. And if you ask me why do you do it, I'm pretty sure I could tell you why in such a way that would, that would make sense. I was just laughing. I was in my office this morning. Uh, I was doing some coaching with somebody, uh, an executive for a big company international company and he, he happened to be in my office and he had just taken the first week of our program and we were talking about it, how, how it was. And he noticed that there were two chairs that were exactly the same size facing each other. And I said, well, and I said yeah, that's how I have two people talk to each other. I have those chairs and I... So, so I probably use it, uh, you know, 90% of what I'll do in the program I'll use. But I mean, I'm a true believer. I don't need you to be a true believer. I just want you to take what makes sense and what feels right for you and, and, and add it to what you already do well. Could you just tell us some words about your family or hobbies or, or any kind of uh, fields of interest which wouldn't be professional? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, I live in the, nor the, the Northeast. Mm -hmm. The furthest northeast state. So uh, we have wonderful skiing, and I'm a pretty avid skier. Mm -hmm. I've been married for 42 years. Mm -hmm. My wife uh, started out as a uh, French professor, and then as I, I moved into gestalt therapy, she ended up becoming a social worker, gave up her French career and just retired, she'd been uh, the uh, senior vice president of a very large agency that worked with adolescents. I've got two adult children. Uh, my daughter is a lawyer, and she's actually taking our program now. Yes. I got her to do it. My son's a social worker. He's a few years older, and he's taken a lot of Gestalt experiences. Uh, I, I love writing. That's, that's my, one of my passions, and I'm, I'm beginning to do more of it. So I'm very, very excited, excited about our new, our new book. It was nice you. meeting the two of you, and I'll, hopefully I'll see you in two months or so. Yeah, hopefully. for sure. Yeah, of course so. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy your day. Enjoy, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.